Suppose that you have a chain, and the chain is laying on a frictionless table, and a little bit of the piece of the chain is hanging over, and you let go. And you can imagine what happened is the chain would eventually fall off the table. And so the question is, what's the motion of that going to be like? Okay, let me go ahead and say, I'm going to do a simplified version of this. I'm going to do a couple versions, and the later version, hopefully I can get to a realistic uh, type. But in this version, this chain moves that way, and then the piece moves down. In reality, in real life, if you had a chain, once it starts coming off, once the chain starts speeding up, then you would get this like thing, something like this, where the chain would come off the table. Okay, so I'm not doing that. I'm doing a non-realistic case. Um, you could imagine that there's some type of uh, pulley here or something that prevents it from uh, moving sideways and just turns it straight down, so you could probably reproduce this in real life. I did this problem already and I used Lagrangian mechanics. And Lagrangian mechanics works just fine. Uh, however, if you want to include friction, it more, makes more sense to not use Lagrangian mechanics. I'm going to use Newtonian mechanics. Okay, so let me just go ahead and use my own system of variables and we can get things to work out just fine. Uh, so I'm first going to call this a distance s. That's how much of the chain is hanging over the table. And so this is a chain of length l and a mass m. And so s is the amount that hangs over the table and that's my that's my variable. This is a one variable problem, right? Because if s hangs over, then this length is going to be l minus s. Right there. Okay, and then I'm thinking the Lagrangian mechanics does work just fine, but but still uh, I'm going to treat this like an uh, Atwood machine, a half Atwood machine. So in a half Atwood machine, you have this. We have a block up here, M1, connected by a pulley to a block hanging over the edge, M2. Now there's a lot of ways to solve this problem. The easiest is to say, okay, what forces are acting on my system? Well, I have the downward gravitational force on this mass, M2, G. Uh, and, and that's really it. You know, there's a tension pulling up, but that tension pulls over here. So if I include this whole thing as my system, that's fine. And then there is a downward gravitational force on M1, but there's also an upward normal force on M1. So that's the only force. The other thing is since these are attached by a string, then the tension in the string makes these two have the same uh, magnitude of acceleration. If this is moving down with the speed of some acceleration, I'm sorry, that would have to have the same acceleration moving that way. That's the only way that that string would not stretch. So if that's the case, I can say F net, and this is in non-directional non dimensions. I'm just calling, I'll again call this the distance, the direction S. F net equals M A S, where S is the direction that's accelerating. So what's the net force on it? Well, it's this, M2G. And then what's the mass that's being accelerated? Well, it's both of those, m1 plus m2, and then that's the acceleration as. So the acceleration is going to be as. It's going to be m2g divided by m1 plus m2. Uh, now, what about the chain? In the chain, you can see the difference is that the total mass is the same, it's constant here, but the part that's hanging over, M2, changes. So, and that means that M1 changes. So in this case, I have a distance S hanging over and a distance L minus S over the, on the table. Then I can say, uh, first of all, let me define the linear mass density. That's gonna be the total mass, M, divided by the length. And if I know that, it gives me a relationship between the length of a piece and its mass. So in this case, M2 is going to be its length, which is S, times the, the, the linear density, M over L. And then that means M1 is going to be its length, which is L minus S, times the density of M over L. So I can put these two things into my equation over here, and I get A equals M2, which is going to be S, M over L, times G, and then down here I get uh, M1 plus M2, actually 
I, it doesn't even matter, right? I don't need M1. Well, M1 plus M2 is M, right? If I take these two, add them together, I get uh, M over L times L, uh, and the SM over L and the negative SM over L cancel. So I just get M. So that means I get A equals G over L, L, S. Now let me rewrite this because this is important. S double dot equals G over L, S. And that's my solution. And that's the solution I found before. So in this case, I'm saying S double dot is the second derivative of S with respect to T. And that's just the dot notation that we're going to use. But that, that's my solution. And that's where I stopped. And that's where I'm going to start right here, right? Because now I want to take this and get an, I want to find out how fast it's going at any particular time and what, what the position is at any time. And so I'm going to have to solve this equation. So let's solve that equation. Okay, before we do that, I know I, I saw somewhere that says, hey, take breaks. Well, here's my break. I'm going to give you a little break here. This is a, a chain. This would be a great chain to use. It's really low mass. But let me get to the end of it. It has an end, I think. There we go. And so I could hang this over a table if I have a nice smooth metal table the friction would be pretty low. And then I could actually model the motion of this as it slides off. And I, I'd like to do that at some point. Uh, we'll see. And now you'll notice this actually isn't, you know, uh, a continuous, it's not continuous mass. It has discrete points in there. But I think that'd be okay, and it'd be interesting to look at that. And so I'm going to try to model this. You can get these chains at the hardware store. Uh, they're kind of fun to play with. So let's solve this equation. So this says S double dot equals G over L S. Now, if you are familiar with other physics equations, this looks a lot like a simple harmonic motion, but it's not, right? The key difference is if this was a mass on a spring, because I have the acceleration proportional to the displacement, and I wrote that poorly. In a simple harmonic oscillator, the acceleration is proportional to the negative of the displacement, so it, it pulls it back and forth. This one does not. Okay, this one pushes it away. So the greater the position, the more the acceleration. And that makes sense, right? Because the more of the chain that hangs over, that's a greater s, the greater the acceleration because more mass is going to be accelerating uh, due to the gravitational force. But how do we solve a problem like that? This says that if I have some function s as a function of t, and I take the derivative twice, I get back a constant times that s. Uh, so this is a differential equation. And the best way to solve differential equations is just to guess. So what functions can I take the derivative of twice and get the same thing back? Well, if I have s of t equals, let's say, a e to the c t, where the a and c are constants, then s dot, the first derivative, is going to be a c e to the c t, right? Because the derivative of and exponential is the exponential, but then I have to take the derivative of the top, and the derivative of ct is c. And then if I, if I do that again, I get s double dot equals a c squared e to the ct. So in order for that to give me uh, this a c t, I have to have, I want it to be this, I have to have c equal to uh, the square root of g over l. So that means I'm going to use s as a function of t. And in fact, actually the same thing would work if I had this as a negative sign. I'd get a negative right here, but then I'd get another negative, maybe positive. So I'm actually going to get two terms in there. So let's write this as a e to the square root of g over l t plus b e to the negative square root of g over l times t. And we can find values for a and b based on the initial conditions. So let's go ahead and take the derivatives of this. So if that's s, s dot as a function of t is going to be equal to a times the square root of g over l e to the square root of g over l t minus b square root of g over l e to the negative 
square root of g over l t. Now I actually know something about these two at the beginning, right? So let's say I have, here's my chain. And let's say at t equals zero, at t equals zero, then this s is s zero. It's just some constant, it has to start somewhere, right? So if I use it up here and I say s of zero equals s zero, then if I put t is zero, I have e to the zero, which is one, and e to the negative zero, which is one. So I actually get s zero equals a plus b. So I know that has to be true. I don't know what a and b are, but I know that a plus b has to be s, s zero. Now let's do the same thing. I'm gonna say that at t equals zero, v equals zero. So I'm gonna release it from rest. So this is the velocity. So I know that s dot of zero at times zero is gonna be the same thing. I need to see to plug in right here. So I get a times the square root of g over l, and then e to the zero, which is one, minus b square root of g over l e to the zero, which is one, and that would have to be equal to zero. So this means that uh, that square root of g over l is in both terms, but a minus b equals zero. So I have two things, I have a plus b is s0 and a minus b is zero. So here I know that a equals b. So if a equals b, then a equals s0 over two equals b. So now I can put everything in my function up here. I get s as a function of t equals uh, s0 over two e to the square root of g over l t plus s0 over two e to the negative square root of g over l t. And that's my solution. That's the position as a function of time. Now let's say I want it to go, um, let's say I want it to fall, how would I, I find out um, how fast it's going? Let's do that. How fast is it going when it's fully off the table? So if, so this would be S, S would be L, right? Yeah, when S is equal to L, it's fully off because I can actually check that answer and I'm gonna do that. So when S equals L, how fast is it going? Well, we're gonna use this function right here. Um, I think I'm not gonna do that because this, this function actually, I would need the time. Uh, I could find the time from up here and plug it down there. I just don't really feel like doing that and uh, because I, I just wanna graph it, uh, but I could do that. So if I wanted to do this, I'm gonna show you the other way to do it though. Let's say that uh, I wanna find the time where S is equal to L. So I could say L equals uh, this whole thing, this whole thing, S zero over two, that's a zero, E to the square root of G over L times T plus s0 over two e to the negative square root of g over l times t. And then I could solve, I think I could solve that for, for t. Solve for t. And then use that over here in this function to solve for the velocity. And say s dot, this is called t final. s dot of t final equals Okay. But I want to do this a different way. I want to find the final velocity a different way, and then I'm going to graph this uh, a couple ways. Okay, so how can I find the final speed? Let's draw another picture. So here's position one. This is where it starts, and that's a distance S0, and it's a total length L. And then at the end, I didn't draw this to scale because I'm I'm not always thinking ahead. And then here is the final position, L, right there. So what's true, if I, if I use the work energy principle, work is the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, and that would be equal to, I need to define my system, and let's say my system is equal to uh, the chain. The chain plus the earth. 
so the chain plus the earth is my system then I can have a gravitational potential energy uh, and I'm going to use the uh, the center of mass of the chain to find the potential energy so let's just write this out so I'm going to say uh, there's no work done on my system there's the gravitational force doesn't do work because it's part of the system and the table doesn't do new work on the system because it's it's perpendicular to the direction of motion so if I put that together I can say 0 equals k2 minus k1 that's change in kinetic energy plus u2 minus u1 which is the change in potential energy let's go ahead and say that y is equal to 0 up here just to make things easier so I'm going to say 0 equals 1 half m v2 squared that's the final velocity minus initial kinetic energy but that starts from rest so that's 0 plus the final potential energy okay so if that's y equals 0 what's the potential it's going to be mgy where y is halfway right because the center mass of that chain is in the middle so this is going to be the final potential is going to be negative m g l over 2 that's the yeah that's right now what about the initial potential energy so it's going to be minus the initial potential energy which I'll put in parentheses and that's going to be the potential energy of this thing plus the potential energy of that but this has no potential because it's at y equals zero so we only have to worry about the center mass of this piece so it's going to be the mass of this piece which is the density m over l times the position which is going to be s zero over two times g and that's negative right so that's the mass that's the distance no I need another that's I need another s0 over here right the mass that's the density times the length gives you the mass okay so let's write this all out 0 equals 1 half m v2 squared minus m g l over 2 plus uh, m over 2 l s0 squared g now I can solve this for v uh, I'm gonna I can divide everything by m and I get and multi, I'm gonna move all that to the other side and multiply by 2 I get v2 squared equals uh, g l right because I'm gonna multiply by 2 and then minus uh, s0 squared g over l and then so v2 is the square root of g l minus s0 squared g over l okay so that's a great thing so that we can check how to do this now one last thing is I'm going to model this two ways I'm going to use my solution right here but I'm also going to do numerical calculation just because you know that's what I do so let's just be clear reminder refresher for the numerical calculations if I know if I calculate s double dot as some value and in fact it would be uh, g over l times s this is going to be equal to the change in a small short time interval the change in s dot with respect to time so that means that s dot final at the end of the time interval is s dot at the beginning of the time interval plus s double dot times the time interval and this is the Euler method of numerical calculations so first is going to calculate the acceleration use that to update the velocity and then you do the same thing because s dot is delta s over delta t so s2 equals s1 plus s2 dot delta t so I'm actually since I just calculated the velocity right there I'm going to use this it should technically be the average but this will work fine and then I'll update time and if delta t is small this should work and then go back up here and do the whole thing again and so I'm going to do that in Python I have two graphs and I can check my answer with my other thing right there so let's switch over to Python and I'll see you there okay so here we are I'm in GlowScript and I want to make a model I want to make a model doing a numerical calculation with the Euler method first and then I'm going to plot the exact solution that we calculated by using a differential equation uh, so let's first start off with a graph because I'm going to need to graph this whole thing so graph equals graph uh, and I will try to remember to include a link down below showing uh, it's a it's a post I wrote about 
uh, creating uh, graphs in Python. So X title, I want this on plot position versus time. So X title is going to be time, not not TMs. Time, no time, no ah time in seconds, and then the Y title is going to be position. Yeah, let's just call it position in meters. Uh, now F1 equals G curve color equals color dot blue. That's going to be my line. Uh, now I need my gravitational constant. G is 9.8. L is the length of the chain is 1. And remember, the mass doesn't matter. The mass of the chain doesn't matter because it cancels out uh, in both ways. So uh, let's not even worry about that. Uh, y max, this is the this is what I'm going to call the, where I want to end the calculation. And you can't actually... Uh, the way I calculated it, it doesn't have any way to know that the mass, that the whole chain is off. No, it does. It does have the chain is off. No, the way I calculated it, it would have an incorrect acceleration after the chain is all the way off the table because it should just go to the acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So let's just put uh, as 1. Uh, S equals 0. This is, this is my starting location of the mass. Okay. No, it can't be zero because then it wouldn't go anywhere. Zero point one, so it's like it's hanging ten centimeters over the the edge. Uh, the initial velocity. Remember, in the in the numerical calculation, I can calculate the acceleration, but I need to have a starting position. I need to have a starting velocity in order to find out what's going to happen after that. So my initial velocity is zero. Uh, now I need time is zero. The time step, I'm going to put zero point zero one. We can always change that later. Now I'm going to do my calculation. So while s is less than y max, do the following. Step number one, calculate the acceleration. So a is just going to be g times s divided by l. Right. The next one is to update the velocity. So the new velocity is going to be equal to the old velocity plus acceleration times dt. Now again, in Python, if you haven't done a numerical calculation before, this may look weird, but it's not. This is not an algebraic equal sign. This is a make equal to sign. So this is take the old velocity, add a times dt, and make that the new velocity. So this is v1 and v2 all together. It's, it's really great. Uh, then I need to update the position. So s equals s plus v times dt. And again, here this is actually v2. This is the velocity at the end of the time interval because I just updated it. Okay. Now I need to update the time. t equals t plus dt. Now I'm going to plot the thing. So uh, f1 dot plot, my x coordinate is going to be time, my y coordinate is going to be s. And I think that is it. Let's save this, and of course I'm going to give you the code down below. Falling table chain 1. I think I have another one in there, so let's put 1. Okay, saved. Run. There you go. Okay, so let's just see if this makes sense. We can't we can't know for certain that it's the right answer, uh, but it does look like it's increasing in speed. Uh, that's good. Um, it it kind of looks parabolic, but you know, it shouldn't be. Uh, let's just go ahead and print out the final velocity. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, print v final equals v. And remember, I did calculate what it theoretically should be. So let's see. I'm just going to type in my equation uh, v final theoretical. I'm going to need the starting position, and I can't use s because I'm changing that. So let's say, let's say this: s zero equals zero point one. Okay. Now down here, the final velocity. I'm just going to type in my equation. It's going to be the square root of g times l minus uh, g times s zero squared, remember squared in, in Python is star star, divided by L. And let's print that, print V F theory equals VFT meters per second. To run it, I didn't save it. Okay, check that out. Uh, they're not exactly the same. Okay, but they're very close. Let's go ahead and make this time step uh, a little bit smaller, 0, 0, 1. That doesn't hurt me to do that, right? 
Okay, now I'm getting pretty much the same thing. And so I think I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, it seems to be legitimate. Those are two things. But we had another way to do this, right? We had another way to calculate, and I need my equation right there. There it is. Uh, okay, so I'm going to have another s variable. And I'm going to have another graph. So up here, this is going to be uh, f2 equals g curve. Let's make this one red. Color equals color dot red. Uh, okay, so down here, I'm going to say uh, s2. I don't even need to put it there because I haven't calculated it. All I need to do is put it down here. Uh, let's go down here and say S2 equals. Now I'm going to type in my equation. It was S0 divided by 2, remember, times uh, exponential of the square root of G over L, G divided by L times T. Now I'm not doing dt. This is an this is an analytical calculation. I'm not doing a numerical calculation. Now I need to do the same thing. And the only difference, so plus the same thing, except this is going to be minus. And then I'm going to plot it. F2 dot plot T S2. Let's see how that looks. I, should, I guess I should save it. Saving it. Okay. And let's run it. And you see I only have one line. And that's because they're right on top of each other. Let's make this a little bit smaller and you can probably see that they're not right on top of each other. There are two lines. You see that right there. And if I zoom over here, you can see there's a, a difference over there. But so I've really calculated that final speed three different ways. I'm pretty happy with it. I did an Euler numerical calculation. I did an uh, analytical solution with a differential equation. And then I found the final velocity used in, using work and energy. Uh, I do want to do a couple of other versions of this. I want to do I want to do it with friction. And then I want to do it uh, by breaking it into a whole bunch of little pieces and modeling what happens as it falls off the table. That's going to be fun. Okay, so I'll probably make those videos. But until then, I will just leave you with some homework. You can play with this code. I'll put some links down below. If you have any questions, uh, include them down below. I typically do answer questions. So I, that'll be it. I'll see you guys.